let me start. Uh, I chose to give um, an overview of, uh, of these topics on which I worked since um, nowadays more or less uh, 10 years, but I will talk about uh, the last uh, five years more or less because uh, it is when new techniques were introduced and when the group in Politecnico di Torino came into play. So the group now is uh, composed by several people. Here I list some of them. All of them are here in Politecnico di Torino except Simone, who was a PhD student here and then he grew up, now he's in Pavia. And uh, the other components of the group are uh, Filippo Boni and Alice Ruigi, who are PhD students, and uh, Enrico Serra and uh, Paolo Tilli, who are uh, the senior colleagues here uh, with me, and uh, Lorenzo uh, is uh, in intermediate, is uh, now faculty here, and he had his PhD here, and then he went to uh, Napoli and, uh, and Rome, and uh, then he, we, we had it back recently. So, um, we'll talk about networks, and also I will use, uh, I'm somewhat authorized to use the word quantum for graphs, and uh, uh, the idea, the basic idea is that we have a branched structure. What do I mean? I mean that there are some uh, uh, basic elements which are vertices and, uh, or nodes, and vertices can be connected by lines, segments, and these are the edges or arcs. And uh, uh, of course, this is a very general structure. You can imagine networks of whatever shape, but uh, I will focus on two cases. The first case is uh, uh, made of, um, consists of those graphs who have a finite structure in the sense that the number of uh, edges and uh, uh, nodes uh, is finite and there is uh, a compact core, but outside the compact core there is at least one half line, perhaps more than one, but at least one half line, okay? And because of the presence of half line, we talk about non-compact graph, indeed, as a metric space, uh, you still not define the, the, the metric space, but we will define metric space, they are not compact. The second category is uh, made of the so-called periodic graphs, and so they really respect the basic idea of uh, periodicity in the sense that there is uh, an elementary cell and this elementary cell is repeated uh, infinitely many times. This can happen in one direction as in this picture where we have the ladder graph or in two direction as in the case of the grid, the grid in the space, I will uh, talk about it later, or also in three and uh, more direction. So these uh, uh, graphs are not only the so-called combinatorial graph where you just look at the topology of the structure. Topology means which are the nodes and which are the connection between the nodes. Here we are interested in a metric st structure because we want to introduce a notion of distance and of something that moves in the space. So in the arcs we put basically an arc length, an arc length that gives us the metric structure. And once we have an arc length, we can easily introduce uh, functions and from function, functional spaces and so on. I will be a bit more precise later. And then I will put some differential operator on these structures. And uh, when we talk about differential operator, then we are allowed to use the word quantum. This is, but when you talk about quantum graph in general, you mean metric graph with differential operators acting on that. So, and now what is uh, a function? Uh, I'm a bit more precise on that. After the introduction of an arc length on the, on the graph, every edge is basically a, an interval, i.e. a bit more precise, E is the name of the edge, and i.e. is the name of the interval, which is nothing but the arc length given by the, the arc length on, uh, on the edge. So in general, we will start from zero, we end, will end up in LE, where LE is the length of, uh, of the edge. And of course, LE can be finite or infinite. In the case of finite uh, arc, we are here in the compact core, but uh, when we talk about uh, infinite arcs, we always mean here half lines. Of course, if we have an arc 
if we, are, if we have a, a graph which is just a line, we can think of it as being two, two half lines. So, so there is an edge, uh, there is a node here uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the middle and uh, an origin somewhat. So we have a half line here and half line. So it is a very general set. And the function G is nothing but uh, a collection of function UE. So there is a, a U on every, on every edge. UE is defined as a, on the real interval, IE. And from that, you can easily define in an ordinary way limits and then continuity and uh, differential calculus and so on. Of course, once you have a function, you can go to uh, functional spaces. And the first elementary functional spaces are the spaces LP. So LP of the graph, G, is nothing but the direct sum of all the LPs of the edges and the, the norm is uh, uh, immediately given uh, if you have a function f in LP on the graph, the norm, the piece power of the norm is nothing but the sum of uh, the piece power on the edges. Uh, this, this is E, so E is in the set of the edge. So this is very natural. The same is, uh, the definition for the space H1 of G, but uh, it is comfortable to add to this definition the condition of uh, continuity at vertices. We will always implicitly in this talk use this continuity condition in the sense that uh, in the space H1, the value here at a vertex uh, is reached from every direction we take in order to reach the vertex. A naive idea of continuity. But our functional space, our environment is H1 mu. H1 mu is made of all H1 functions under the mass constraint. We will call the square delta norm the mass, and we fix this mass to be equal to a positive number mu. And we will work on that. Okay. And what is our work? What will we do? The basic, we will do the basic uh, uh, variational problem. Because we seek for ground states. Okay, this, is the, this was the starting point of our work some years ago. Ground states in this context means the following fact. First, of course, we need a functional. And the functional we will use in all this talk will be this one. This is a sort of classical functional uh, that can come from different physical situations. Uh, uh, we think of uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation that gives us, gives us a conserved energy of this type. There is a kinetic part, here the L2 norm squared of the gradient, here the gradient is just the first derivative, we are quasi one dimensional. And uh, here there is a, a negative potential because uh, the underlying equation is the focusing NLS. And, uh, okay, this is just uh, the integral notation for the same thing. And, uh, of course, uh, we want minimizers of this functional, but, uh, but it is clear that uh, this functional has no minimizers. Has no minimizers globally, because uh, if we take uh, a function u and then we multiply by lambda, here, from this term, we have a factor lambda to the pth power. Here, lambda to the second power. So, p is larger than 2 in our problem. This I forgot to write, but we will always have p larger than 2. We are in a sort of semi-linear situation. So, p larger than 2. So, uh, what happens is that lambda to the p brings everything to minus infinity as lambda goes to plus infinity. But, of course, we are uh, thinking of another problem. The problem is... Uh, ground state at mass mu. This is why we use the space H1 mu. So we want to find or to establish whether a minimizer at mass mu for this functional exists, okay? So the important object is the infimum of the energy in the space H1 mu. Here, basically, the graph will be, will be fixed. We will treat every graph separately. And we will use this notation. This is just a notation, a sort of italic C, G of mu uh, is equal to this infimum. And in order to have a ground state, what we want is that uh, first the infimum is finite. 
otherwise we go to minus infinity and we cannot have any minimizer. And the second is that it is attained. So these are the two features we, we, we must ensure. This is the problem. I will talk about this problem. And let me spend some minutes in order to give uh, some uh, physical motivations. And uh, so there are here experts of, uh, of the, the, the connection with physics and in general of the, the transition from the so-called fat graph. This is the fat graph, which means uh, that it is a three-dimensional structure in which only one direction is important, at least locally. Here only one direction is important and then there are nodes and that node, there are more than one dimension that are important, but however nodes are in either in finite number or at least they are a discrete set. So they can be treated in somewhat uh, ad hoc separately. What is the underlying physical idea? Whenever you have, for instance, a signal starting from one point and running to a vertex and then the signal meets the ver vertex and it splits in some transmitted way. In general, there will be a reflected way. So the physical picture which is underlying this sort of problem is very general. It is of this type. So you can think of many physical situations of networks is a, an extremely general scheme. But I like to, to, to cite some old results. First of all, one pioneering result uh, in which Rudenberg and Scher, uh, more than 50, more than 60 years ago, computed the, the energy spectrum of the valence electron in uh, uh, naphthalene, so in some organic molecules. And uh, basically, the scheme they adopted was very simple. So consider this. Uh, the usual structure, sorry, the usual hexagonal structure of the organic molecules, and you can imagine that uh, the valence electron have a wave function that is traveling through the bonds, the bonds which are exactly the sides of the hexagon. So I'm doing this uh, uh, model. Uh, tables uh, of uh, uh, sort of milestone in, uh, in the computational chemistry. So this, this was an idea of Linus Pauli. And then there are many other possible applications. Here I basically stressed the, the application related to quantum physics. For instance, here quantum chaos is related to to the distribution of eigenvalue for linear spectra too. But uh, what I will focus uh, is a uh, nonlinear effect. What are, what are the nonlinear effect in branch structure? And uh, here we, we cited the, the, the first works in the 90 from, uh, from Bilo, and uh, here I forgot to write uh, the, the seminal book by Ali Memeti, if I remember well, it is on. 94. And, but uh, what I wanted to, to put in evidence here with this very short and non-comprehensive list was that uh, in the last years there were really a lot of uh, works on that. Really, and I'm mm, forgetting a lot of people, but uh, uh, it was really in the last 10 or 5 years that uh, a lot of effort concentrated not only on the analysis on graph, but on nonlinear graph. And uh, I talked about uh, um, ground states, but uh, there are uh, now some works, uh, some absolutely uh, non-trivial uh, non techniques works on uh, uh, excited states. And uh, so there was a work by myself with Sarah and Tilly in 19, but with the techniques that are similar to the ones I will uh, uh, very rapidly draw today. And uh, very recently, uh, work by Pierrot and Soave Verzini, a group from Milan, who analyzed the so-called critical case and uh, uh, found the result of existence of uh, bound states, even though there is no ground state. So there, is a, uh, there are solutions of the stationary problem that are not minimizer, uh, constrained the minimizer of the functional. And another work by Simone Dovetta, Marco Chimenti, Micheletti, and Pistoia in 19. So there are a lot of people that are 
um, converging somewhat to, this, to these topics. But for myself, uh, uh, the, my favorite physical connection is uh, given by the Bose-Einstein condensation. And so I think in the last 20 years, everybody, uh, also pure mathematicians, learned what is a, a Bose-Einstein condensate. So it is not need to recall that uh, uh, it is a system made of identical boson. And uh, when the temperature of the system is flowered, uh, at a, a level which is very close to the absolute zero, then there is a phase transition of the system. And what happens is uh, something really non-classical, something extremely exotic. All particles collapse to the same quantum state, which is exactly the opposite of what fermions do. Uh, boson, they concentrate in the same quantum state, while fermions have to, to pile up, uh, uh, raising their energy. The state cannot be the same because of Pauli principle. So this is really a realization of, uh, of bosonic matter, of the, the principle of bosonic matter. What is the connection? The connection is that from the 60s, we know that the, the quantum state, which is called the Bose-Einstein uh, state, the condensate state, can be mathematically found as the minimizer of a function which has a shape like this, has a shape like this, uh, where here I put omega. Omega is the spatial region where there is a trap that collects all this particle. And uh, uh, here, of course, the notation is a bit different. Here we have uh, the gradient because, in general, we are in three dimension. Here we have a power which is not generic b; it is a power four, and the coupling constant which is g. G remembers the interaction between couples of particles. It is linked to the scattering lengths of this interaction. And the fourth power, for people who study the rigorous derivation of uh, this function, uh, recalls the fact that you are considering Kapolos power. And in general, this is uh, the only part of the function which is studied. And uh, normally, the sign here is plus, g is positive. But if we introduce also the presence uh, of the three-body interaction, we get another term where the power is six. There is a uh, uh, some nowadays old work by Thomas Chen on that. And uh, there is another coupling constant gamma, which in, is in general much, much less than G. And this is the reason why only this term in general is, uh, is uh, considered. Now, as I told you before, I'm considering the energy function with a minus sign, even though G for normal condensate is positive. The reason is that there are uh, uh, some mechanisms, in particular one mechanism which is called the Peshbach resonance and Peshbach mechanism, that can uh, allow experimenters to modulate this uh, G here. And when modulating the G, this G, it can go to minus sign. So we can create from uh, condensate with particle with positive scattering length, which means that the particles are repelling each other. Also, uh, we can modulate it up to have uh, an attractive condensate that uh, also in finite time can blow up. And this has been studied also experimentally. And we will focus on this case. So starting from this functional, what we do is first, instead of different powers, we consider only one power with a generic P larger than two. Second, instead of omega, we consider graphs, which means that the region omega is somewhat a sort of fat graph. And it exists. There are many nowadays quasi one dimensional so called cigar shaped condensate and also branchy ramified condensates. And uh, uh, moreover, what I want to, to stress is that uh, there is now a sort of a keyword uh, that it is spreading quite fast in the community of the physicists, both theoretical and experimenters, which is uh, atomtronics. So the idea of atomtronics is to do electric, to make electric circuits. So it is a, an electronic, but not with electrons, but with atoms. So the idea is construct branch, branch structure and make information be conveyed not by electric charges, but by neutral condensates, neutral small condensate of atoms. And this is quite fast developing and it is a, 
probably something that in the future will, will uh, have some importance. So I spent, already spent a lot of time because in this way one starts talking and forgets everything. So I will go to, to, to the mathematics. So I saw of uh, I saw of giving you the result. Uh, it is an overview. So I will give you the result first for the case in which p is between two and six, which is called subcritical, as in the usual standard nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Then I will show you what changes in the critical case, which is p equal to six, and then I will say something about periodic graphs, the grid, and these are all works in which I participated. And then I just have two slides on another topic, which is the topic of the three graphs, which is extremely difficult, extremely challenging, but uh, uh, it is not a work uh, in which uh, here I took part, but it is a work by Simone Dovetta, Enrico Serra, and Paolo Tilli. However, so I start now from this case, finite non-compact graph. So the easiest finite non-compact graph is the real line. As I told you before, think of the real line as being as being the union of two half lines like that. This is classical Soviet school and then also the French school. So uh, we know that for every value of the mass, for every value of the mass, there are ground states, and these ground states are the translates of a unique shape, which is the so-called soliton. The soliton can be written explicitly for every P, and uh, uh, the shape is this one, it's a sort of uh, shape of a bell. The energy level of the ground state is negative, this will play some role in what follows. And uh, uh, another uh, important uh, uh, remark is that uh, due to this uh, structure here, mu to some power x, there is a natural length scale which is connected to the mass, which is exactly the inverse of the mass here. This brings a length scale. Moreover, when p is equal to 4, we are in the famous cubic case, because we have a power 4 in the energy, but power 3 in the equation. And uh, in the cubic case, uh, uh, the system is integrable, so all computation can be performed uh, uh, exactly, and the expression is uh, very nice for, uh, for uh, the soliton and for the energy, minus mu cube of 96. Then after the real line, the second simplest uh, graph is the half line. Here we have only one half line, and ground states are half solitons. You take a soliton of mass 2 mu and you cut it in two, and you have a half soliton, which is the minimizer, and uh, for p equal to 4, of course, you can write it down uh, explicitly. But now notice that the energy is minus mu cube over 24, which is better than minus mu cube over 96, which is lower. In this sense, from the point of view of lowering the energy, the half line is better than the full line. And now we go to the infinite n star graph, which is the starting point of all this research. It happens that uh, for every mu, irrespective of the choice of a positive mu, the infimum of the constrained energy is equal to the energy of the soliton, the infimum in R, but it is never attained. So there is never ground state. This was, uh, at the beginning, a surprise, at least for us. And uh, there are minimizing sequences, of course, and they are what we call the quasi-solitons, in the sense that uh, you can think uh, of uh, sequence made of a soliton that this, uh, when the sequence goes, when n in the sequence grows, then this uh, almost soliton goes toward the infinity. Why? Because when it goes to infinity, it can really replicate a soliton. When we are here, near the vertex, there is a tail. There is a tail here that does not allow, because of the constraint of continuity, does not allow to, to uh, extend to a soliton. So there is some energy loss here, okay? It is not optimal. In order to become optimal, we have to push it up to infinity. This is the mechanism. And uh, uh, so I talked uh, about that in 2013 in Bielefeld, I remember, and then uh, it started a discussion on, uh, so it is possible that the only graphs that admit quant uh, ground states are uh, a line and half line. At that time, we were not able to say 
uh, neither yes nor not. Now we know that it is not true. There are many graphs that can have a uh, uh, ground state, but first we had to, to understand something. Another example, the second example, were bridges. Bridges, so it is uh, the, the, the picture in my view is quite clear. So this is the three bridge. What we found is that, again, the infimum in the bridge is equal to the energy of the soliton with the same mass, but again, minimizing sequence are quasi-soliton that are running in the half line. Okay? This conclusion does not depend at all on the number of bridges. So we can use four, five, two, whatever we want. But curiously, it is very simple to prove this result if the number of bridges is, is odd. Why? Because uh, here we have the three bridge. You can uh, consider this bridge as a line. You can unfold it into a line. And so you have a function on the line, but with a constraint which says that in this point and in this point, the value of the function must be the same because it is the same vertex, and also in this point and this point. These two constraints are not compatible with the soliton. So you are restricting your space of function to a smaller space where you have no soliton, so you lose the minimizers. The only way to find the minimizers is to recover them up to infinity. This, this is the principle. If you have an even number of bridges, this is not true. You cannot import it into a line. And for the two bridge, you already need all the machinery that I will develop. But from this, we learned a message, a qualitative message, which is important it is that the minimizer so i have to charge my apple pencil again but the minimizer wants to escape the intricated zones this is the the message so then we tried oh this is a bit uh, okay and now we go to to a lemma <laughs> to, to some true mathematics so this is a general lemma on weakly convergent sequences Okay, we consider a graph having a half line and a sequence un at fixed mass mu that weakly converges. Of course, there can be a loss of mass. We call this loss of mass m, the difference between the mass mu of all the elements of the sequence and the mass of the limit. And as a notation, let lambda will be the infimum of the energy ung okay i'm not supposing that it is a minimizing sequence this is just a weakly convergent sequence then if you have no loss of mass then the sequence converges strongly in l2 and in lr for every r up to infinity excluded if you have a partial loss of mass then lambda this infimum of the sequence the end of the energy of the sequence must be strictly larger than the minimum of the energy of the soliton times this ratio, which is always less than one. So here he, you are losing with respect to the soliton because it is negative and this is less than one. And this is also larger than the energy of uh, a function u, sorry, a function which is the weak limit normalized to the mass m. And third, if you lose uh, all of the mass, so your weak limit is zero, then the infimum must be larger or equal to the energy of the soliton. If we apply this corollary, which is quite general, to minimizing sequences, then we obtain that uh, or a corollary is compact or it is a quasi-soliton. Why? Okay, if it is compact, you have no loss mass. So uh, you have, because convergence is strong, so uh, you have in, in the first case. If, uh, you have a partial loss of mass, your infimum is strictly larger than the energy of the soliton, or better, either than the energy of the soliton or the something which has been smaller than that and which is given by a true function which is in our minimization space. Okay, so this cannot be a minimizing sequence. It, there is a better competitor. And uh, uh, in the last case, if you lose all of the mass, then the infimum is the energy of the soliton. So in this case, this quasi-soliton, if solitons are not available, this quasi-soliton are 
minimizer. So the message, the main message that arises from this lemma that uh, the existence of the ground state is decided by a competition between quasi-soliton and strong converger. But quasi-soliton live on the half lines. So it is a competition between the half lines and the compact core. This is the, the heart of, of the matter for what concerns this, this case. We, in order to have, uh, in a, another way, in order to have a ground state, we must be able to construct, to produce a compact core, which is good enough to trap a function which is better than the solid. This is uh, the philosophy. So, in general, so we can, from this lemma, I have uh, many ways of formulating our uh, seek for ground states. First, if you have a uh, non-compact graph F, if the infimum is strictly less than the energy of the soliton, then the infimum is attained, so you have a ground state. And in general, if you are able to find a function U whose energy is not larger than the energy of the soliton, then you have a ground state. This is more operative, and in general, this is how we construct example of graphs with ground states. First result. First result is a negative result, and uh, it uh, gives us a, a more precise idea of what I told before. Minimizers want to escape intricated zone. This result is purely topological, so the uh, lengths of the arcs have no role in this result. So there is a, an assumption, a hypothesis, which we call H, that says every point in the graph lies on a trail that contains two half lines. What does it mean? It means, what is a trail in particular? A trail is a, a path through adjacent edges, a continuous path that never repeats the edges. Okay, this is just a graph theoretical word, nothing more. And so what we have here in this picture is that every point belongs to a structure like that, to a trail that connects to different points at infinity. Okay? Notice that uh, there are graphs that violate, that violate H. For instance, if you have only one half line, you cannot satisfy H. You need two half lines to do that. And also H can be violated, for instance, by the presence of a structure like those terminal edges. Terminal edges, so you have a half line and you have an edge here. If you want to connect these two points at infinity, you have to jump here up and then to go down. If you want to connect them passing to this point X, you have to repeat at least part of this edge. So this is not a trail, and this violates our hypothesis. So what does this hypothesis do? It does an existence and non-existence result we assume that G satisfies the assumption H, then we have that the infimum is always equal to the energy of the soliton with the same mass, but it is never attained except on some sort of pathological example, and I know that James Kennedy knows this example very well in other contexts, a pathological example that we call the bubble tower, which, which are like that, you immediately see why they guarantee the presence of a ground state because they can host a soliton. Only one, there is no longer the translational symmetry, but they can host a soliton, so attain the infimum, which is this one. Okay, this was the first negative result. I will skip the sketch of the proof, and I just tell you that uh, it is just a, a simple application of uh, some. Uh, rearrangement methods. Uh, so now it's in it, it's simple, but in order to understand that, it took a lot of time to us. But uh, of course, there are graphs uh, that do not satisfy the hypothesis H. First, uh, I show you this one. Also, another guy called the sign post graph because of the presence of uh, this uh, pole here, the pole of, uh, of, uh, of the sign post. And the quite famous in literature, the tadpole graph, which has one line and another like three-fourth graph, and you can prove just by, uh, let me call it uh, still in the, uh, the word uh, from James uh, and uh, Grisha Bercolaico, uh, with some surgery of graphs, you can immediately show 
that the mean, the infimum, the constrained infimum is always attained here. Okay, and one can use rearrangement. So, and the last thing of that part concerns what is the influence of the metric, because uh, what I uh, showed uh, before is that the topology, there is a simple topological hypothesis that prevents uh, these ground states from existing. Now, what is the role of the metric? And uh, just let me give you an example. You have, uh, for instance, a graph made of three half lines and a pendant. Of course, this graph does not satisfy the hypothesis H. Hypothesis H guarantees not non-existence. So we don't know what happens if the graph does not fulfill this hypothesis. What happens here is that there exists a critical length of the pendant here, of the terminal edge, such that the infimum is attained, so there is a ground state, if and only if, this terminal edge is longer than this critical length L star. So there is a, a, a it is very important that uh, the, this guy here has a has a capacity enough in some sense, can host a, a, a correct amount of mass in order to make the ground state to exist. I want to stress one fact, I, I forgot it, but uh, the minimization problem is, uh, is unconstrained at the boundary. We have no Dirichlet conditions and so on. So here, naturally, we end up with Neumann conditions at the end here, okay? So when stretching this guy here, you can imagine that this Neumann condition can bring more and more function, higher and higher, and it, this allows ground state to, to exist, okay? Okay, this is all for the first part. This is the subcritical case. This is the picture. Second picture, the critical case, P equal to six. Critical case is much more technical, also in the context of graph, and uh, uh, results uh, were uh, uh, to us, uh, in some sense, more, so, more surprising. We have to change a, a way of thinking because uh, many strange things appear. I recall you what happens in the lines. Starting point is what happens in the line. I apologize whether you, you know very well what happens, but I, I will be quite short. Now, this is the functional. And uh, uh, if you consider this mass preserving transformation, this rescaling of, uh, of the U, we are in the line, so we can do it without bothering about the geometry. So if we consider this uh, mass preserving tra transformation, then the kinetic and potential term in the energy scale in the same way, which is lambda square. So this is typical of a difficult, serious problem of, uh, of loss of compactness. And so the final result is the following. This is, there is a special value of the mass that for our choice of the constant in the functional it is this. Okay, this is called the critical mass. So the critical uh, uh, power brings uh, notion of critical mass, such that if we exceed the critical mass, then the constrained function is not lower bounded. Otherwise, if we are below, it is lower bounded by zero. Ground states exist only in correspondence to this mass. Below and above, they do not exist. And uh, uh, so the basic notion of the critical mass is that below, we always have positive energy, and above, we always say that the functional goes to minus infinity. It is not lower bounded. So how does the critical mass come out? There is only one important notion, which is the critical, so-called mass critical gagliardo near given quality. We can estimate the nonlinear term in the functional by the kinetic energy, because here we have the same power too, which is important, time this factor here, which is the mass to the square. Okay? Now, take this inequality, which is classical, and put it uh, into the expression of the energy, and you find that the energy is larger, larger because we put the inequality in the negative term, larger than the kinetic energy times a very simple factor. And in this factor, the role of the mass is clear. If the mass, mass square, is less than 
than, than this quantity, then the energy is positive for every u because this parenthesis is positive. So consider now the mass preserving transformation as before, the stretching or the squeezing. So we have uh, a factor lambda square on the energy. So if we let lambda goes to zero, we see that we can bring the energy as close as zero than we want, as we want. So we have that the infimum must be zero here. This is what happens below this quantity, which is, uh, which is exactly the value of the critical mass. Now consider the case in which the mass exceeds this bound. And consider a U which is close to optimality in the Gagliardo Nirenberg inequality. What does it mean? It means that here we have that U is larger than this guy, where there is this bracket. KR is optimal. So if this U is almost optimal, this quantity here be, will be less than zero. Sorry, not this quantity here will be less than zero. So we have that in this case, there are functions with negative energy. Again, we use the mass preserving transformation, but this time we let lambda go to infinity, which means that we squeeze the, the function and we find that, that the energy goes to minus infinity. So it is, there is no uh, lower, lower bound. And uh, it is uh, how we found, uh, not we, it was found classically, the, uh, critical mass, and we can perform exactly the same reason, reasoning for uh, the half line, obtaining these two values for the critical mass and for KR. So, what we use here, okay, I, now I try to, to go from the line to graphs. There are three ingredients Gagliardo Nirenberg, then stretching for small mass and squeezing for larger mass. So first of all, for the Gagliardo Nirenberg inequality, good news. It also also a non-compact graph. It's just a matter of rearrangements, one line in proof. We have the same Gagliardo Nirenberg inequality, but with a different optimal constant. Okay? So in general, we have an optimal constant, which is between KR, the constant for the line, and the optimal constant for the half line. Since the critical mass can be defined the square of the critical mass as uh, the inverse of uh, the optimal constant, we have that uh, a notion of a critical mass, a natural notion of the critical mass for graphs gives a mass which is larger than the mass, uh, critical mass uh, on the half line and smaller than the critical mass on the line. But the question is whether this mu g that we defined spontaneously plays the same role, whether it discriminates between minus infinity and zero. This is the question. And now, in order to understand it, we have to examine what happens when we stretch and squeeze. So, stretching. Stretching means that lambda goes to zero, so our function becomes flatter and flatter when lambda goes to zero. So, in graphs, in our graphs, we can repeat exactly the same procedure. Why? because we have half lines, and so we can uh, use uh, to stretch. Can you, can you see me? Can there we are some strange stop buttons. hearing you for uh, a few seconds? <laughs> ah, okay, oh, sorry, there was a problem here. Okay, and uh, uh, so I repeat here, we can stretch functions on non-compact graph by exploiting the presence of half line. We can do that. Squeezing. Okay, as before, we can start from, uh, um, from a function which is close to optimality. So we have a function with uh, negative energy, and uh, then we ask whether it is possible to squeeze the function up to obtaining energy equal to minus infinity. And this time the answer is no. It is not possible to squeeze and obtain energy minus infinity. Why? The simplest example here, I cannot get rid of this Wi-Fi and so I don't have all the possibilities of notability. Sorry, I will do with blue pen. So consider the, the tadpole. The tadpole 
we can prove uh, that uh, we have uh, a critical mass, which is exactly the critical mass of the half line. So smaller, it is half of the critical mass of the line. And we choose uh, mu, which is larger than the critical mass of the half line. So we can have a function with negative energy. For instance, we can put it, we can put it here. It is quite convenient to do that. This is here. Now try to stretch it. It is not simple because the graph must remain the same. So the stretching must be organized. But however you can decide to organize this stretching, what happens is that sooner or later, the function, the stretch function, will be concentrated mainly on a small interval. So it will become like a function on the line, not on the half line. And uh, so you end up approximately with a function which sits in the line, but whose mass is less than the mass of the line, the critical mass of the line. So you cannot go to plus infinity. In another way, when doing this process of, of, of stretching, you attain some minimum, but then you grow again and again because when you stretch, sorry, when you squeeze a function on the line, a function with a, a mass which is subcritical for the line on the line, you go to plus infinity. So this process of going to minus infinity sooner or later is blocked by the topology of the graph. And this is the principle why in graphs there are many strange things happening. So I will give you the theorem on that and then uh, perhaps I will stop because uh, well, the rest of the material is too long. But we have four theorems um, through which we classified this case. The first theorem, sorry, try to, I, okay. The first theorem is the following. We have only one terminal age and then a complicated graph here. Then we, all, we always have that the critical mass in the graph is the critical mass of the half line. And uh, the energy goes to minus infinity, so there is uh, no ground state if mu is larger and zero if mu is smaller. And there is never ground state, only if we are already on the half line. This can look quite strange. Why we are reducing this uh, graph to a half line? This, uh, much more complicated. And the reason is uh, simply that here you can try to see the half soliton, except that here then you have to, to deal with uh, strange matching. So it is not really a half soliton. But uh, when you apply the mass, plus, this becomes taller and taller and because becomes closer and closer to the half solid. So at the end, for the sake of minimizing, even though the structure of the graph is very complicated, only this guy counts, irrespective of its length. Because here in the critical case, we lost the notion of length scale. This is the first thing, but it is not so surprising. The second is much more surprising. So consider a non-compact graph that has exactly one half line, but no terminal edges. Otherwise, we are in case one. Then again, mu g, critical mass of the graph, is equal to mu r plus. Again, we have uh, that uh, the energy is not lower bounded if we exceed the critical mass of the line, not of the half line. We have zero if we are below the critical mass of the half line, and in between, we have that uh, the negative energy is attained as a minimum, and we have ground states. And this was very surprising. This has no counter, uh, uh, no, no corresponding case in the, in the line and so on. Third possibility hypothesis H. Okay, when you, we have the trail connecting, passing for every point and connecting to points at, at infinity. So the situation here is not uh, very exciting. It is uh, like in the line, we have a minus infinity above mu r, zero below. And again, there are tower of bubbles appearing, but the fourth theorem is much more interesting because it tells us that there are some non-compact graphs, for instance, this one here, with no terminal edges, more than one half line, 
do, that do not satisfy some portion of H such that mu G is strictly between mu R plus, mu R plus, and mu R. And again, in this case, we are non-trivial. Finite energy ground states, negative energy ground states, when mu is between the critical mass on the graph and the critical mass on the line. Of course, uh, the formulation of this theorem is quite strange. There exist non-compact, I should say, if there are non-compact non graphs, graph uh, has a, satisfies this hypothesis, then there is this consequence. But we know that they really exist. This is an example, and one can construct many other examples. So, the final comments on this uh, critical power uh, phenomena is that uh, there are these theorems 2F4 that describe a new phenomenon. Ground states exist for all values of the mass, of the mass uh, in a in a non-trivial interval, it is a true interval. It is not only the critical mass, it is an interval. And moreover, the fact that ground states have negative energy can, may sound normal, but it is not. Because uh, when you have a negative energy function in uh, standard LS, you have that in, in the critical case, you have that in finite time, it collapses through blow-up solutions. In this case, no, it is stabilized by the topology of the graph. This is another strange phenomenon that we started to investigate, but we still don't have any result. So I, I just give you a picture of, uh, of the other part of the talk. I will, we analyzed the two-dimensional grid, and the two-dimensional grid showed uh, another new interesting phenomenon that we called the dimensional crossover. I will I go immediately to to the result that says that uh, a critical behavior, so which with the existence of, the, of a critical mass, is present not only at one critical value of the power nonlinearity, but in an interval of the power nonlinearity between four and six. And four and six uh, is not random because six uh, is the critical power for the line, and four is the critical power for the plane. And the grid mimics the plane at a certain length scale. And the, 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 very, the very last thing I want to show you, even though it is not a result of mine, by, but by Simone Dovetta, Enrico Serra, and Paolo Tilli, the same problem with trees. It is completely different. It is, again, much, much more technical, even in the subcritical case, because trees have a hyperbolic structure. So the volume of uh, the space volume is uh, exponentially increasing when going through the tree. And so, uh, unexpected consequence is that, uh, not expected by us, but it was uh, well known by a harmonic analyst, is that here you have a Poincare type inequality. And using this Poincare type inequality, then you find a, a result which is quite, uh, quite strange that tell you that, uh, tells you that. Uh, when p is uh, less than 6, again, because for 6 we always have one-dimensional critical phenomena, and larger than 4, but this 4, as far as I know, perhaps Simone knows, as far as I know, it's, it's not really clear why it is there. So there exists a critical mass mu star such that ground state exists only with a larger mass than mu star. And, uh, Moreover, there is the importance in determining the existence or not of this lambda one, which is exactly the best constant in the Poincare inequality, which is sorry, the best Rayleigh uh, uh, ratio of the function of the tree. And uh, uh, this um, problem on trees is lar largely unexplored and, uh, and extremely difficult. So, you are at the last slide, and unfortunately, this does. Uh, so I, I write it here. I have a, my black. I, I write here. Thank you to everybody. I, it is possible to, to read it. <laughs> Thank you to, to everybody for uh, for inviting me, and it, it was uh, really a pleasure to be to be with you. Thank you.